my honor today to uh, introduce our speaker, Robert Krajinki. Uh, I first met Robert it was around 1982, uh, and uh, we were in need of a new minister at the fellowship. In those days, we had a paid ministers who basically were, were hired, and they ran the church. And uh, Paul Solomon uh, heard about this guy named Robert Krajinki, who had become very popular in our spiritual community because he had just published a, a trilogy of books uh, interpreting the Edgar Casey teachings on the Bible. And uh, it was a big, it was wonderfully done, and, and Robert was greatly appreciated, and Paul thought this would be a good guy to be the minister of our church. And uh, so he asked Robert, Robert agreed. And uh, the first time I actually met Robert, met you personally, Robert, was uh, we, I took Robert, well, we both went out to lunch at the Jewish Mother, and that's when I got to know you personally for the first time. And since that time, we've become the best of friends. Uh, Robert remained the minister of our church for the next three years, and he went back to Detroit. His family owns, owns a, uh, at that time, owned a big uh, Buick dealership in Detroit, uh, Motor City. And uh, Robert went back to work for his, his family-owned Krajinki Buick and did that for a while. And uh, then he came back here in 2000 and about 2001 has been back here since that time. Robert's just a pillar of this church. He, to me, he, he is the representation of pure love and service. And everybody that knows that, I see a lot of heads nodding. Everybody that knows that about Robert knows that. And uh, so Robert, uh, come on up. Let's, get, let's hear what you have to say today about your love for animals. This is my bag I always carried when I walk my dogs. So I'm talking about dogs, I can't leave it behind. Here I thought you were Santa Claus. Well, my story begins on Christmas week, between Christmas and New Year's Eve 2001. My first wife, then, the beloved former now, was driving from her uh, body work session out in the uh, semi-rural part of uh, the area there, the suburbs, and she was coming down this dirt road, and it was cold and wet and pot, pot holes in the road and ice and snow, and she sees this cocker spaniel trudging along the side of the road. And she says, oh, she wants to stop. But she says, I got two dogs at home and I'm busy. You know, I, I have clients that come and so on and I can't. So she says that and then she looks in the rear view mirror and she sees the dog trudging along the road throws it in reverse, opens the van door, the dog crawls in, comes up to the front part of the seat, curls up by the hot air blower, and falls asleep. So she brings it home, and, <clears throat> and she says to me, I found this dog on the side of the road, it's going to be yours. <laughs> She says, you've been shut down a lot emotionally, so this, this dog will help you. So, <clears throat> um, we had to wait to call, because uh, the record bureau and all that was closed on Christmas week. We had to wait a week to find out, because it did have a token, you know, uh, an ID stuff on his collar. So she called the Bureau of Re Records on the first day it was open in the new year and we found out the guy said, oh, he said, that's my friend's dog. The friend uh, leaves the dog there and, and the dog sometimes will come to my house and uh, walk along. But we thought that he had got hit by a car or wandered into the woods. So you found him. And then Lynn was saying, she thought, we can't return this dog to that. That, that. And the dog, so we learned the dog's name was Buddy. And, and that evoked a memory to me when I was a freshman, uh, or my first year at University of Berkeley in California, 
during the time of the student uprising and the Vietnam War protests and all that stuff, a lot of activity uh, uh, being stirred up. And <clears throat> I wanted to write. That's what my purpose. I wanted to write. So I had my little typewriter back in those days. And <clears throat> my wife, uh, first wife, Joan, she found this stray. I think it was a lab was wandering the neighborhood and she invited it to come in and she called it Buddy. She wanted to call it Buddy. And so I would be writing away the great American uh, protest story and all that stuff. That was, uh, I remember it was a play about Bull Connor and Birmingham and the uh, 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 civil rights uh, marches and so on. And I'm writing and I hear this sloppy, uh, sound at my feet and I look down and there's the this dog, Buddy. He's chewing up my wallet and my student ID <laughs> and everything. And this uh, so I get into a fury. I am really angry. He is chewing up my identity. <laughs> and uh, so I get up and this dog has to go, I tell Joan. Get it out. <clears throat> and so she does. And I just, I was so angry at that dog at that time. I was so shut down, let's say, emotionally. I was not in my heart at all. I was in my head. And <clears throat> I didn't have any good thing to say about that dog. A few days later, she's standing by the front door. And she says, I want you to come out and see this. So I, okay, I go out and I look and there is that dog lying dead a couple of uh, houses down on the front lawn. And she said, you killed it with your negativity. And I said, I don't care. I felt powerful. And that's where I was back then. So when the little cocker spaniel that Joan uh, Lynn found, my second wife, and said, here, you take it. It's, you're shut down, it'll help open your heart. And its name turned out to be Buddy. So that was uh, too much of a synchronicity. So I became very interested in, in little Buddy. And <clears throat> sure enough, it did start opening my heart. And our grandkids lived over on the next street, so they came over because they, they heard there's a new dog in the house and they wanted to see the new dog. And oh, we had to name it because we didn't want to name it Buddy, not with to carry the energy of where it came from, plus my energy towards the first Buddy. And so <clears throat> Megan, one of the, were, the granddaughters were twins, and they had just seen To Kill a Mockingbird in school. And they said, Atticus, we're going to, what's the name of Atticus? <laughs> and Atticus seemed just like a perfect name. And the, like the English judges wear their wigs down, he had his long floppy ears and everything. <clears throat> but he, um, he, when we got him, and when Joan got him, I, I took him into the bathtub to wash him because he was so dirty and stinky and so on. But when I put him in the bathtub, the water ran red off him. And I thought, he's got open sores. But I looked, you know, his belly and so on, didn't see any sores. A couple of days later, we took uh, Atticus to the groomer, and the groomer said that was, the red was flea, feces, and blood, dried blood from fleas. So he was a, a net, you know, abused and neglected dog. But, he, like the, in the little video, God's always wagging his tail. He had a, a, a spirit, in spite of the hardship of the life he had gone through. So let's take a look at Atticus. There he is. <laughs> So, so Atticus, uh, 
So he became Atticus, and my wife and I, we were having a lot of uh, discord in our relationship at that time. She could, she was a Leo, and she could get very volatile. She had a lot of things, and I, I could get very shut down and, and go in and become silent. And she would get more volatile about that approach. So finally, one day she said, I can't take it anymore, get out. So I had a friend, he lived down uh, in another part of Detroit, not far from where I grew up. So I took Atticus and we went into my friend's house, and which wasn't too far away from uh, where I uh, grew up. And, <clears throat> and uh, so Atticus and I, I would take Atticus to the old neighborhood, because it was close by and I could walk the streets I grew up on, neighborhood bring back memories of friends and girlfriends and stuff like that. And I'm walking Atticus one night on the street, sidewalk, and I hear a voice. Now it's not a vocal voice spoken with vocal cords, but it's a complete sentence, every word audible and distinct. And it says, in my next life, I'm going to be a golden retriever. And I thought, so I look at Atticus. I want him to look up and kind of wink or something. <laughs> did he really say that? Where did that come from? But he continued going down and sniffing grass and lifting his leg where he had to. And so I had to file that away with the subconscious, you know, mysteries, unexplained mysteries. Where did that come from? Filed it away. And uh, so we continued that. And then one day I get a phone call, an unexpected phone call from none other than Bruce Shelton. And Bruce Shelton says, would you like to come back to Virginia Beach? and work as a caregiver for my father. Now, his father was 90 plus years old, bedridden, and, he said, and Bruce said, you can live up on the upper floor of, actually it was Bruce's childhood home too, where the, the family grew up in. It was two stories. Dr. Shelton was on the ground floor in, in, in bed. So I had the whole run of the second floor with Atticus. And, <clears throat> It was a very nice arrangement, and yes, I wanted to come back to Virginia Beach. I had been kind of yearning for that for as long as I was up in Michigan. I had to go up with my father. I got a call from my brother, and he said, "You, I had been away since uh, college years. I just, and he said, if, if, uh, if you want to have some time with Dad before he passes over, go now. So I went up and... Uh, in, I think it was 88, and spent 13, or maybe I came back when it was 88. I don't know, but I spent 13 years up in Michigan uh, with uh, my dad passed. But right after my dad passed, I met Lynn, and, and then we got married. So, <clears throat> but then the marriage was very different. And we were both working out stuff. We were both committed to healing and, you know, understanding our, it's our stuff that's getting in the way. But sometimes it got to be too much for her and too much for me. So I moved into uh, my friend's house and down to, uh, to my old neighborhood. But now, so we started to make arrangement to, to move back to Virginia Beach. There wasn't anything in, in holding me in, in Detroit. So, <clears throat> came back with Atticus to Bruce's childhood home and stayed up there and we walked and I'm wondering all the time about, is this, is he coming back as a golden retriever? How can that be? And, uh, and Atticus is as good a care as I tried to give him as best I could when we, the vet said, this dog, when we brought him for the first time to the vet, this is going to be a money pick. He recommended euthanasia. 
But I thought, not that I thought, but I knew there was some process going on here with this Atticus. So, no, I couldn't let him go, and it, it turned out he was a money pit. But, <laughs> but it was money uh, well worth spent, money well spent. He, he got better and better, and his eyes brightened, and he overcame a lot of stuff, but he couldn't overcome everything. So we had him euthanized. And the odd thing was, and once he, uh, and the, the vet said, how do you want to dispose of the body? We can either do a mass grave with the other ones, or you can take them home. And I said, well, just put them in the mass grave. Because oddly enough, I didn't feel any connection to the, the body once Atticus was gone. I thought, he's free of that body. It was a hard life in that body. He did well in that body because he was always friendly unless you touched one of his hot spots and he had a few of those. He had, uh, he could snap, you know, if, if he touched a hot spot. And we lost a couple of groomers that way. <laughs> But he was always friendly, as Cocker Spaniels are. Cocker Spaniels, uh, there's an American breed of Cocker Spaniel, and there's an English breed. There's a bigger a bigger breed, and the American Cocker is, is smaller. But they're friendly, they were bred to be uh, indoor dogs, family dogs, yet they still had the kind of energy and toughness of uh, the hunting dog. So they made a pretty ideal kind of uh, dog and are quite popular in the uh, United States and I guess over in Europe too, in England. So, <clears throat> once... Pardon me? Oh yeah, we had... Uh, uh, Atticus was euthanized. And you get to the point... Uh, that this just came up re recently for me too with uh, the other dog I want to talk about. There's three dogs here. And I had a, a, a tale for the talk came to me when I was coming driving over to church. It was three angels, twelve legs. <laughs> three angels with twelve legs. But anyway, so uh, Atticus was put to sleep. And, and then, but the prophecy in my next life, I'm going to be a golden retriever. I said, well, I'm going to, so I started looking for uh, golden retriever puppies. I said, he's going to come back, he'll be a puppy. That's, that was my expectation. But where, where would I find this puppy? You go to a pet store, you go to the SPCA, or you just kind of wait for the universe to to bring you, you that dog or not. And <clears throat> time uh, went by, and it never did get answered. But here at the fellowship, uh, first a word about golden retrievers. Now, I didn't know much about golden retrievers. I knew they were beautiful animals. That was about it at the time. But what I know about golden retrievers today is they are the dog of the new age. In that way, I mean they are perfect new age spirit dogs. They are beautiful, they're friendly, they get along with everybody. They're, you know, they just, they don't have a mean streak in them. Unless they're mistreated, then they uh, will be, you know, get defensive. But let alone under normal conditions, a golden retriever is just, and it was, it, uh, it's a new breed, it didn't exist before, it was uh, officially recognized by the uh, American, what do they call it? Kennel yeah. Society, yeah, in 1925. So it's, and this was uh, bred by existing Spaniels, by, a, and it sounds like a Saturday night, uh, uh, was it uh, Saturday Night Live? Saturday Night, you know, the comics show. Yeah, Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. Sounds like a character from a Saturday Night 
skip, but it was the golden retrievers were first water spaniels crossed with existing retrievers and resulted in the breed we know today as the golden retriever. But it was led by uh, a man who was a uh, in Scotland and he was the Baron Tweedmouth. <laughs> but he had a vision. He wanted to shape a certain kind of dog. So he did a lot of experimenting with other breeds to, to finally get where he developed the Golden Retriever, which had all these positive qualities. So it was like the spirits working through him to br bring this dog of the new age in, and <clears throat> to me anyway. I, so, so, uh, so now Atticus is gone, and I'm coming to the fellowship again on a regular basis, and we have a new young lady starts coming to the to service, and she's kind of a fun person. Plays the guitar, sings. She is a librarian at, in the children's division of, in Virginia Beach Library. And so we started up a, a little friendship and <clears throat> she invited me over to her uh, house for lunch. And we go in and I see this dog, what I call, it looked like a dog in a cage, a big cage. But now I see in the PetSmart store, they got all these cages, I guess they call them uh, kennel, kennel, kennel crates or something like that. To me it looked like, why are you putting it in a cage? age for. But the dog was sweet, looked up, and he, he didn't bark or growl, it just looked like expectation on his face. And uh, Cindy says, oh, my daughter. I said, I didn't know you had a dog. She said, oh yeah, my dog just dropped it off on me without a warning when she's going up to uh, freshman year in her starting uh, university for freshman year. She just came by, dropped the dog, and, and off she went without a warning. She's, and the dog pees on the carpet and does this and does that. So I have to keep it confined during the day when I'm at work. So she, I said, well, let's take it outside. We took it outside and the dog was playful and, and fun and, and I really liked the dog. So a few more weeks go by couple of more visits and then she says I'm going to go on vacation I have to go up to New York because she's from New York from Albany she said I got I want to spend some time with my mother so would you would you watch the dog for 10 days would you consider that and I thought well of course <laughs> I said, I'm home during the day, I'm writing, so I'm right by a sliding glass door that opens up to the backyard. I can let the dog out at any time, so the fact that it might not, it, might, it turns out I had a urinary problem. <clears throat> and uh, so I'll take her. And I, so first day, second day, no problem, third day, fourth day, fifth day, there's a problem developing. Sixth day, the problem is really getting overwhelming. Seventh day, eighth day, ninth day, I decide I'm not going to ask if I am going to tell Cindy I want to keep this dog. Because the problem was I was falling in love with it. <laughs> day by day, it was such a perfect, beautiful dog, a golden retriever. And I said, well, she's a full-grown golden retriever. She's too old to be Atticus. Because I'm expecting Atticus to come back as a puppy. <laughs> and so we had uh, uh, Molly. For, we got some pictures of Molly, don't we, Francis? That's Atticus. And then we get to Molly. Isn't she a lovely... And we got some more, right? We have some more. Yeah, show one or two more. There she is. Look at her. She's just, a, she's golden. She's just, a, it's just lovely. And, and good with kids, good with people.
people, just, you know, what they, just a new, new age dog. <laughs> Loves everybody. <laughs> and, uh, so, <clears throat> there she is. Oh. No. In every other way, she's an ordinary dog. All my three dogs kind of were ordinary. They didn't do tricks or whatever, but they had this quality that we looked at. There she is. And there's, uh, the next dog is right behind her, Cassie. Big smile. And <clears throat> so we, w we went to the beach, we went to the park, we went everywhere, we, went to, we had a lot of gatherings in the backyard here, celebrations and so on. And Cassie was always, uh, not Cassie, Molly. Molly was just, you know, fit in. Everybody loved Molly. Everybody did. So, I was happy. But like, uh, dogs have short lives, and she already had, I don't know how much, uh, years before I got her. But and then came the time, you know, uh, again, you, you know she's not doing well. She's less and less, she's getting up. She, she found a, a place by the sliding glass door where I would work, and I knew she was on her way out. And, <clears throat> and I was going to take her to the vet to get euthanized, to cut it short, because I knew she was sick. But the, the vet couldn't get her in that Friday, so she said, well, bring her on Monday. Well. On Saturday, I got spared to, uh, I didn't have to take her in because she passed away on Saturday. And then <clears throat> I had a great attachment to her body, not like Atticus. Atticus, I, like I say, it was a hard life in that body and he was free now. He was, what they say, on the other side of the rainbow. But Molly, I just wanted to hang on to her. So, again, Bruce stepped in, Bruce and Marty. Because I, I didn't want to cremate her. I just, I didn't know what to do with her. I wanted to. So Bruce offered that to, he already had one dog buried in his front yard. Uh, so he said, bury her, uh, you can bury her on the, and next to, uh, what, what was that dog's name? Kitty cat. Kitty cat. <laughs> Was a kitty cat? Oh, so next to a cat. <laughs> so she gets along with everything. <laughs> Spirit or not. <laughs> anyway, so we did, and Tom Weber, some of you might remember Tom Weber, most of you probably don't, but he was a good friend, he used to work at the ARE. He offered to, uh, to help me dig the, dig the hole. And I had this child blanket that was given me, you know, like a child that might have it, all bright colors and animals on it and all this stuff. So that was her winding cloth. We wound her in that, took her over to, to uh, Bruce and Marty, and we buried her, and, and there she is. With the St. Francis statue to mark her resting place. <clears throat> now, while Molly was... Uh, a lot uh, with me. We had another dog in the house. Now where I lived, it was a, a, a family room that was converted to a mother-in-law apartment. And then the mother-in-law didn't move in. So it was like, it had been converted over. And because I had known uh, the homeowners for a long time, uh, they had, uh, and they knew I needed a place to stay, so they offered the mother-in-law apartment. And <clears throat> it's nice, and I'm still there. Uh, so when I moved in with Molly, there was a, because it was originally part of the house, there's a little corridor, and there's a, it leads to the, the household kitchen. And, <clears throat> and so I could go in the kitchen and so on and so on. But in the front room, I discovered when I moved in, there was a 
Labrador Retriever, or Labra, Lab, Labra, 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 Labra. <laughs> right. And, and the, and the Labra dude, he'd get up and put a paws on my chest and kind of, and I, again, some of that old uh, uh, shutdown self would come out and I'd get mad at the dog. <clears throat> so I didn't want to, and it turned out that the, the owners, the household owners, they wanted to get a, they were used to uh, miniature poodles, smaller poodles. And when they, they bought uh, Cassie over there, she thought it was going to be a miniature, small, but it just kept growing and growing and growing. <laughs> so, you know, when you, you get something, you thought it was something, and it turns out to be something else, you're not that interested in it. So I noticed that the, the Cassie, the dog, his name was Cassie, was kind of just left in the, the front room there. So that was okay for a while. But Cassie would find her way through the doorway into, into my apartment and became very good friends with Molly. I would find them sleeping side by side in the, in the hallway there that led to the kitchen out of my room. So that was nice. And, uh, and and I I enjoyed Cassie, and we would all the two of us would we would go uh, on walks together. We would go down to the beach, and I would meet. We had a little routine. Uh, uh, Tench Phillips, who owns the Narrow Theater, he has a couple dogs too, and we used to uh, meet and, and walk together with our with our dogs. It was a nice a, a nice. Uh, part of the daily ritual. And here we are with Cassie on the beach. <clears throat> but when after Molly was died, she wasn't euthanized. She actually died while I was petting her. I could feel the, her life just kind of go out of her body. And it was that was nice because it was a gentle way to go. But I didn't have the attachment to her body and wanted and I appreciated the uh, offer to, to bury her, where I could visit her if I wanted, visit the grave. So now Molly was gone, and Cassie was confused. It was sad. She would come and look for Molly, couldn't find her. So I started to take more uh, attention to Cassie because she wasn't getting much attention from the homeowners. So I started taking her out, taking her out, falling in love again. <laughs> She's a playful spirit. And the interesting thing about Cassie is, I never had this happen before, only with Cassie. You know how you, you might have a pile of clothes on the floor, or a, you might have the drawer of your dresser open and things like that. I would see for a flash Cassie. I kept seeing flash images of Cassie over and over and over. And I don't still to this day don't know what that was about, but I didn't have it with Molly, who I dearly loved, or Atticus, just with Cassie over and over and over and over again these flash images throughout the house of Cassie. I don't have a conclusion what to tell you of <laughs> what, what it meant. Maybe you have an idea. <clears throat> but eventually that, that went away and it became just a more regular relationship. But we continued walking. We'd take a walk. And <clears throat> there she is. Now look at it. I, I spent a lot of time with her because I was in the uh, rehab center last year for four months. And when I came home, uh, I couldn't, uh, wasn't able to drive or get out much. So she and I spent a lot of time together in my apartment. And I got to the point 
where you get beyond all the things that you're told dogs are and you really get in touch with the essence of the dog, the spirit of the dog. And I said, damn it, she is an E.T. <laughs> Yeah, look at that dog. There's an intelligence in there. You can see, like in a, one of those uh, Star Wars movies, one of those otherworldly characters could come like that. But she was very smart and very, very loving dog. Oh, she was. She was so kind and sweet. And and uh, she might look aggressive, but she wasn't. She would chase squirrels. She would chase cats. She liked to do that. She could. But mainly, mainly she just liked to kind of hang around. And then as she got older, her hind legs started to tremble. And then the trembling began to get more pronounced over a period of time. To finally, just recently, not too long ago, she, her, she went down on her hind end and couldn't get up. And so that was the beginning of the end. And then I don't know who it was told me, it's selfish if you don't put her to sleep. If she can't get up, she's not having a life of any kind. So that was a very hard thing to do. But it was because you knew it was the right thing. It went, it went against your emotional body. You want to put her to sleep. But then your moral sense and your uh, ethical sense and just the love of the dog, because you knew she was, she was just lying on the floor, she couldn't get up. Uh, so we made the appointment and uh, I took her over. I don't think anybody went with me, I don't remember. Oh, no, Baron, yeah. The, the uh, lady of the, one of the homeowners, the one who bought Cassie, thinking she'd have a little dog. But, mm -hmm. So we took Cassie over to be euthanized. And I'll tell you this experience. I knew what was coming. I knew the procedure, so I was prepared for that. And I knew it was painless, effortless, it's the best thing you could do. You give them an injection, and then in a few moments, they're gone. So, but the vet says, this Cassie is resisting. Like, she wants to live. She's not ready to go yet, despite her um, disabilities now. She's hanging in there. And I had her on the table, and petting her, petting her. And she looked up, oh gosh, <laughs> I might not think. She gave me this look, like the darkness is coming in, and she's losing the light. She's losing the light and the darkness. And she looked at me and she gave me this look like, she knew that she could trust me. That was a little look. I trust you. What's going on? What's happening? And then just a few more moments, and off she went. And uh, so, Cassie was so precious to me during that time where I couldn't drive, couldn't get up. I spent a lot of time feeling. Uh, alone, isolated. When Cassie died, was gone, I realized what a role she was playing in my life because the, the loneliness came back. And the, the, some of the feeling of being isolated, which I never had with her, it's so nice to have a living, breathing, responsive, Creature, God's creature, who loves you unconditionally, no matter what. The love is there, and just that. And I guess that's really what God uh, nurtured in this time where I couldn't get out as much. 
was that really that feeling, what it means to be loved unconditionally. What unconditional love really is. Oh, it touched my heart. And along with that came the, uh, the, the understanding of man's best friend. That is not just a saying. Actually, there's some dynamic in the fiber, fiber between man and dog that creates these kind of experiences. And, and Atticus was uh, um, there's a lot of sacrifice with Atticus because uh, when I could go out, I didn't want to leave her alone. And so there was lots of times I had to give up going out and uh, staying with Atticus, which was okay with me most of the time. But it was a sacrifice, and that's made me think, this is why people abandon their dogs, because they become uh, troublesome. They get in the way of their life, so they just either drop them off at the SPCA or drop them, just drop them on the street, wandering the street. So that's... Yeah. So when we read how we treat our animals is, is very important. We gotta love them like they are angels. And as my friend Judy Dumas says, dogs are angels who take on that form to get us through life, to help us get through life. And if that isn't a concise statement of what dogs and animals are, they give off this love and life, and they help us get through life. So that's my story. Thank you.